On a windswept hill in England in a cemetery, I've read there's an epitaph on a woman's grave that reads this way. Here lies Arabella Young, who on the 5th of May finally began to hold her tongue. <laughs> Whenever I think of that, I think, what was Arabella like? And don't be like Arabella. Tonight, we'll be reminded as we conclude Romans chapter 16 and the book, how not to be and how to be aware of those who can be contrary and disruptive to the kingdom of God and God's work. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the auditorium of the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs with Laura sitting just behind the camera. Hello, Laura. She's waving at me and uh, waving at you. Hope you're doing well. I uh, want to encourage you to be a part of our live Wednesday night. That happens at 5.30 with an amazing meal. And then followed by prayer time around the tables and a short devotion. So you'd always be welcome. Uh, I continue a series through uh, the Ten Commandments this coming Sunday. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Be a part of the Bible study and the outreach. And You know, Lord, I didn't tell you this, but I got the quarterly reports and this church fed over 1,500 people, I think, this quarter. Definitely over 1,000 for sure. It's amazing what God is doing and we are grateful. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that uh, you are life. You are joy. You are love. Thank you that you enable us through your indwelling Holy Spirit uh, to not be disruptive, to not be difficult. Uh, help us to be very sensitive to those whose motives are contrary. And they're not wholesome. And they're not really uh, exemplifying what it means to be your child. Help us to be sensitive to that. Help us to grow in you. Bless everyone who's watching, those who are facing physical challenges or any other challenge. I thank you for the privilege to pray for them. I thank you uh, for Wanda Lynn, who maybe is watching tonight from Michigan. She's moved to Michigan, but she's going to come back from time to time, and we'll be very grateful when we get to see her. Bless the teaching of your word and everyone watching. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you can tell, <coughs> kind of struggling with my asthma tonight. I don't know what's in the air. Uh, it's fall. I guess there's all kinds of stuff in the air. I have water over there. Thank you. So uh, we're in the book of Romans. Paul writes to Rome, the Christians there, uh, all the way from uh, Corinth. It's without question his most amazing letter, his uh, magnus opus, if you will. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, Paul writes 13 of them, but Romans is amazing. Someone once described the book of Romans as an ornate ring. Uh, think of a gold ring, something beautiful. But uh, actually, chapter 8 is considered to be the diamond in the ring. But chapter 16, he's got some things to say on the way uh, in, toward a conclusion of the book. And we begin reading in verse 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out. For those who cause divisions and create obstacles, contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. Sometimes we think we should uh, embrace uh, controversial people or disruptive people. The Bible is very clear. Warn a divisive man or woman once, twice, have nothing to do with them. Now, obviously, the goal of church discipline is always reconciliation when it's possible, but sometimes it's not. And to be honest with you, the body of Christ is far more important than one individual who is... Uh, destructive and contrary and his admonition here is watch out for those especially who teach things that are in direct uh, opposition to God's word so we need to know what the word says and teaches and then not be afraid to speak out against those who try to twist it so it's a good warning uh, 2,000 years ago it's certainly a good warning 2,000 years later he describes their motivations in verse 18. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, mainly their own objectives, their own goals, their own uh, ulterior motives. I remember when I pastored years ago in another state, I mean, every bit of 25, 30 years ago, 
this certain person who was destruct destructive, but he was very sly about it, very conniving. And inevitably, if he wanted to try to affect the direction of the church, he would take me to lunch. <laughs> it was never just lunch. It was always an ulterior motive. So be aware of people who really are not helpful in building up the body. They're really destructive. Paul warns us, we're wise to heed his warning. He says, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive the hearts of the naive. Basically, don't be naive. How can you not be naive? How can I be astute and well uh, read in the sense of understanding the, the concept of God's word? You've got to be in it. I've read only 11% of Christians read the Bible every day. Don't let that be you. If you wait for a pastor to uh, exegete a passage and preach, and all of that is important, and I will always try to do the best I can, that is not sufficient to provide the steady diet of instruction from God's word that will keep you from being naive or easily uh, deceived or persuaded. He says, the, here's, here's their uh, method of operandi, a modus operandi, <laughs> their MO. For such a person do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Smooth talk, flattery, telling you what you want to hear, building you up. So how could they possibly be wrong when they insert something that is negative and contradictory to God's word? Well, they do it all the time. Verse 19, <laughs> he affirms them. It's a great message. Verse 19, for your obedience is known to all. He clears off the spot. He lets the Roman Christians know that their service to the Lord has reached his ears, his life in Corinth. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. It just gets better. Paul is saying, I'm grateful for you. I haven't met you, but I've heard good things. And yet he inserts a but. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. You need to be discerning. In our culture today, uh, deception is ever around us. Think of, think of AI. Laura and I were watching a, a Sunday morning episode recently on CBS. It was talking about the a proliferary of uh, artificial intelligence. And it's amazing. Um, AI is basically uh, computers that can simulate uh, human uh, interaction. They can write songs, poems. It's a dangerous thing because it mimics the real thing. And so Paul is saying here, I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent to what is evil. Verse 20, what a statement. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. What an important thing to look forward to, the defeat of Satan. We know <coughs> that after the rapture of the church, when Christ comes to take us to be with him, that will usher in seven years of horrific tribulation here on earth, especially the last three and a half. Antichrist will make his presence known. There will be a brief peace treaty in Israel the nations of the world will stand down. You know Israel is surrounded by 95% Arabs who hate them. But uh, briefly, the beginning of the tribulation, the world will be, from outward appearances, at peace. But it's a temporary peace. At the end of the tribulation, our Lord returns with us in tow in all the armies of heaven in Revelation 19, where he will defeat his enemies with the breath of his mouth. One lone angel will be charged with taking Satan, chaining him, and putting him in a bottomless pit for 1,000 years. During that 1,000 years, we will live and rule and reign with Christ in our perfected bodies. Bodies, the Bible says, fashioned like unto his glorious body. So Satan's demise, Satan's imprisonment is 
closer than it's ever been. At the end of the tribulation, however, he is loosened and will attempt a coup against God and his forces, which includes us. But with the breath of his mouth, again, the Lord wins the victory. Armageddon is over. He will judge the world finally, completely, at the great white throne judgment. And then he will make the earth over by fire, and we get to live with him in eternity on a remade earth. You know, this is October of the year. Beautiful time in Colorado. The aspens are golden, and they're glittering and shining. Laura and I hope to go up and see them this Saturday, we tried to go a couple, we did go a couple weeks ago. They're still green. Not so much now. What a difference two weeks makes. And what a difference time makes over the injustices that we see every day. I'm just wanting you to be reminded it won't always be like this because our Lord is coming again. And Paul gives him that hope. The God of peace will soon Crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God's riches at Christ's expense. He's wanting to uh, remember some influential people in his life. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. Uh, those men mentioned had all traveled with him, helped him, assisted him. And he's thinking about them. I, Tertius who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, Paul had a stenographer. He uh, dictated Romans to uh, this writer. And so he just wants to interject something. I, I say hello to Paul, I want to say hi. It's a reminder as he lists these names, some Jewish, some Greek, all important to God's advancement of his kingdom, that every child of God matters. Never forget the importance Incredible impact of you praying for someone or loving someone or exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit to someone. He writes about Gaius in verse 23, who is a host to me. That's interesting. And, I, and at the book of Acts, a Gaius also provided lodging for the Apostle Paul. Don't you love those people who have the natural gift of hospitality? They just make you feel good. <laughs> and uh, being with them enriches your spirit. Always seek to be that kind of person. Be a refresher. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, he, his uh, hospitality wasn't limited to an apostle. When he saw a legitimate need, his heart, his home was open. That's awesome. Greet you. So he says, Gaius, who is a host to me, the whole church greets you, meaning the church here in Corinth. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quarius greet you. So God had reached some of the political uh, infrastructure of Corinth uh, as he writes to the church in Rome. Here's the doxology. Sometimes I think I need, to, I need to do a sermon series on the great doxologies of the Bible. Basically, the closing sentiment, the closing prayers of God's word. How epic is Paul's closing thoughts as we have journeyed together through the book of Romans these many, many months, listen to this. Now to him, meaning to God, now to him who is able to strengthen you. Aren't you glad for the strength of God? According to my gospel, it didn't mean it was his in the sense of his uh, personally. It means it's what I'm proclaiming. The gospel is the same, no matter the time or the century or the um, millennium we're in. The message is the same. God demonstrated his love toward us. And while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. <coughs> Pardon me. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. He's talking about how throughout uh, millennia, God had prophesied, even way back in Genesis 3, when there was the fall and Adam and Eve uh, ate of the fruit and were expelled out of the garden, and God put an angel with a flaming sword to bar their entrance. By the sweat of their brow, they would earn their living. God initiated a plan to rescue humanity. And the promise of the Messiah is replete throughout 
the wisdom books, throughout the minor prophets, throughout the major prophets, where he would be born, how he would die, his victory over death, what he would do to rescue us. All of it was planned over, over uh, epochs of time, thousands of years. And a lot of people then, before the coming of Christ, were wondering, well, when is this going to happen? We look back, and he has come. We look up in anticipation of him coming again. It's not a mystery anymore. Christ has reconciled us to himself through his death, burial, and resurrection. <coughs> And so it says, but has now been disclosed. It certainly has. We know how to get to heaven. The Bible's very clear. It's through Jesus. Not for by grace are you saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not saved by works, but because we're saved, we will do works. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared for us to do in advance. Ephesians Two ten. Serve the Lord with gladness. Be active in, in honoring Him. Making a difference with your brief life here because He is worth all of your life. But it has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Verse 27 wraps up his thoughts. To the only wise God be glory forever more through Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans, what an incredible book. No one compares to God. No one compares to Jesus. And the good news of the gospel, as a wonderful theologian, Carl F.H. Henry, once said, it's only good news if it gets there in time. If you're saved tonight, it got to you in time. If you know those who aren't, and don't we all, let's pray that they'll get saved before it's eternally too late. I've enjoyed this journey with you through Romans. You say, well, Pastor, where are we going next? I'm glad you're wondering that. I'm following the schedule that I teach here on Sunday mornings live to a Bible study I lead. So we're going to be for a couple books anyway in the minor prophets one of my favorite books is the old testament small book of habakkuk habakkuk will start with habakkuk one next wednesday night online we'll always have the online service for those who can't come here in, in person but habakkuk is this prophet who asked the question that all of us ask in our minds and are seldom willing to say it out loud. Where are you, God? The world is going to hell in a handbasket, and we wonder, where are you, God? And the point of Habakkuk is God is right where he's always been, planning, strategizing for how to reach people who are hardened to his love. Habakkuk won next week. When we finish Habakkuk, which would take probably month, six weeks, we're going to go into the small book of Jonah. Jonah, the reluctant prophet. And then, most likely, we'll jump into the book of John for the next 10 months. The Word of God is so bottomless. Someone said, it's so, the gospel is so simple that a child can swim on the surface and so deep that a theologian can drown but it's God's word, verse by verse, precept by precept, studying it together, praying for one another, what rich times we have, and I'm grateful. But I long to see you in person. So if you can, plan to come soon and know you're always welcome. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for these dear people. Thank you for our journey through the book of Romans. Thank you that when the world is falling apart at the seams, you are in your heavens. You are in control. And I'm so grateful that there's never panic in heaven, as Corey Ten Boom used to say, but only plans. Rest, help us to rest in your plans as they unfold in our individual lives and in the life of this dear church and in this community, this state, this country, and your world. 
Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven is our prayer tonight. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Don't let it ever be said of you, here lies Arabella Young, who on the 5th of May finally held her tongue. Be a person who builds. The world's in short supply of those. Good night, folks.